This week on a complete guide to four-wheel drive, we're back in Natal at Stony Ridge where we're going to learn how to drive through deep water. Our Land Cruiser is in the Richtersfeld. Remember we fitted a, a raised air intake? I decided to do a little experiment and compared it to a vehicle traveling with us that didn't have one fitted. Interesting results. And in the Kalahari, our convoy finally reaches its destination, the famed western woodlands of the Kalahari. Right, the first thing we're going to do, Quentin, when you approach a river or anything like that, is to actually get in and walk through the river. That, that's going to be your first thing. Here we can see the river's nice and clean, so that, that's good for us. A muddy river, then you're going to need to walk a little bit more, maybe get a stick and place it into a spot where there's a stone or anything. Let's walk and see what it looks like. You're going to have to take your shoes off and roll your pants up a bit. But anyway, we, we better go in. We're looking for the texture. Jeez, this is nice. This, and, and have a look at the texture underneath. I normally jump on one foot. If you remain on the surface, then you're all right. The second thing is I don't want to go below my knee height in here because if I sink in, although the weighting depth a lot more, if I sink in, I'm going to lose another 200 odd mils of, of play there, of depth that we're going to go in right up to here. And that's going to be too deep. We want to go stay below the dorsals on the vehicle as we sort of go through on here. We'll indicate our route that we're traveling on. We can put a stick into the ground there. If it's rocky, very rocky, we need to go very slowly because you're going to get a bounce over the rock and everything like that. And if it's muddy or sandy, we like to be in a gear. Second gear, low range as we sort of go through at a normal flow through the river. Yeah, that was a previous chap that we, we sent in first and he disappeared. We never saw any more of him. Steve, what about the electrics on the car? Obviously depth of water. Well, we'll have a look at this, uh, this vehicle here and we'll notice that and in this particular vehicle, the electronic control unit sits underneath the seat and um, the, the water level um, would be equivalent to about here and if the water comes in it would cover the electronic unit. Now if the water is fresh water it shouldn't be too much of a problem but if it's salt water the salt water will create havoc with the electronics in that, in that control box. And this, this is why we, we, we recommend that you stay below the knee level on the vehicle. So if you place my leg against here, you can see below the knee level, we well below the sill of the door, allowing you a couple of inches of movement on that. But bearing in mind, if the vehicle gets stuck, it's going to sink in. That's why we have to know what type of surface that we're traveling on. Okay, so if there's a chance that we're going to get stuck and lose it, then we have to pick a new line on, on our travel through the water. Quentin, the most important because we want to look after our vehicles and crossing rivers are dangerous. You know, you've got rivers that are influenced by tidal zones as well that will come and they will alter the depth. Also, when you enter a river, it's always enter it at an angle, okay? There's a bank that's going into the river, so the nose is going to go in. If you enter at speed while doing that, the nose is going to go right into the water and the chance of bending a fan and the fan hitting the radiator are great then. Okay, so we, we've got to respect our river crossings, make sure that we, we do them correctly as we sort of go in. And the choice of gears as we sort of go in is very, very important. The line as we've lined up as we go into the river, that's very, very important because one, if you're out of line as you sort of go in, it makes it difficult for the vehicle to even start to go into the river. You approach to the river as you go in, wait for the front to sort of come up and then power it across and keeping a steady momentum across the river as you go through on that. Slightly my way, that's good. All right, as you sort of turn around, face upstream, just make sure that the river's not flowing too fast because that'll enter the engine compartment.
then I had a question, what happens in the engine bay, if anything, at this depth? So I decided to open the bonnet, stick a camera inside and see what happens. At low speed, virtually nothing. But at the same depth and a little faster, Mercedes G class or the Galanda Wagen and when it was launched in 1979 it was truly ahead of its time and during its launch this is what was said about it the G was noted as a technological masterpiece with the aerodynamic drag of the Vienna Holzberg Palace it's definitely a 1979 vintage vehicle and in fact it's incredible they are still building this vehicle today and they've hardly changed it at all. This is the 461 series, this is the basic series. Wind up windows, oh they did do electric windows in some models. It still has uh, paintwork showing around the doors. Its dashboard has not changed one iota since 79. And the G is, well, as a good all-rounder, I don't think it's the best. As an off-roader, there's nothing to touch it. The trouble is with this car, is that you just can't find places difficult enough to drive through. It just, it just does it. When the G-Class was released, it was compared with a Range Rover because it had very similar suspension to a Range Rover. But it is a completely different animal, especially now, obviously, with a Range Rover being top in the fashion stakes. The Galandewagen was always meant to be similar to like a Defender or the, the rugged Land Cruiser FJ series. It's a rugged, basic workhorse. And you can see it. Rear differential lock. Hydraulic, it's a relic of the military designs that Steerpoch were involved in. And that's the front one, also hydraulic. Automatic gearbox, this one very, very well tuned to off-road use. The gear change is very, very rapid, which means it's a little rough on the road. Not seriously so, but it's a, it, it is. They haven't changed this since 1979. It is exactly the same. There are very, very few vehicles that have a reputation of the Galandewagen at climbing slopes. There's something unique about the Galandewagen's gearbox, and this is it. In an ordinary four-wheel drive, I have to stop before I put it in low range, not the Galandewagen. I can do it on the move. I'm driving along, this is what I do, watch this. I go into neutral, put it into four-wheel drive, low range, bong, low range. I don't have to stop. Brilliant for showing off. This guy has no carpets, and for that I am very grateful. And this is why, after a long safari, you pull that up, you unclip that, and then you drain all the water that you've sprayed in to clean out the inside down the hole. When you've finished, you put it back. I love it. Oh, I can't get through this. I'm not a razor blade. Now let's see if the G-Wagon is at home on road as it is off. As an all-rounder, the Galandewagen is a lovely vehicle and um, I have owned one myself and it's one of my favourite vehicles. Off-road, superb. On-road, <clears throat> you pay the price for such a good off-road performer in that it's a little bit noisy. Most Galandewagens are a little bit underpowered. This one, the 290 GD, I wouldn't say is underpowered, but it's certainly not overpowered. I can cruise at the speed limit, but it's a bit noisy, flat windscreen. What's lovely about it is that you can load it. You can really load this vehicle. It handles the load beautifully. For the kind of vehicle it is, its steering is also very precise. And the drawback comes when you're on the long haul, doing long stretches. It's, uh, it can be compared with vehicles like uh, Land Rover Defender, a little bit noisy, firm suspension, but generally as an all-rounder, um, it's, a, it's a magnificent piece of machinery. The 
two types of jacks we're going to speak about. Firstly, the high lift jack, and secondly, the air jack or balloon jack. The high lift jack. The kit consists of a pair of gloves, of course the jack, and also fittings on the vehicle and on the jack to allow you to jack it. Vehicles coming out of the factory off the showroom floor are not equipped, generally speaking, for lifting with a high lift jack. Firstly, they need some kind of bull bar, some kind of bar on the back, some kind of fitment to enable the jack to jack on without damaging the vehicle. Second part is the jack itself, in many cases, should have some kind of attachment to fit to the jack to enable the jack to then work on the vehicle. The uh, other part of the kit is a jacking plate. Most of the time when you need a jack, you're jacking because you sunk into soft ground. The trouble is when you jack, the jack then sinks into that soft ground. To stop it sinking, you need some kind of jacking plate. I use a piece of wood. There are a lot of things available, but to be honest with you, a practical alternative is a piece of wood like this. I'm going to demonstrate the high lift jack now. I'm going to jack the vehicle in the middle of the vehicle because often when you're stuck, you want to lift the entire vehicle, front of the vehicle up, and then push it off the jack to push the wheel onto, wheels onto fresh ground. This vehicle now is sitting at a slight tilt this way, and we know that whenever we jack, the jack tends to pull towards the vehicle. So you don't actually put the jack upright, you compensate for the lean of the vehicle and also the fact that the jack will lean in. So The reason for using a jack to lift a vehicle when it's bogged is either to pack grippier material under the wheels or to push the vehicle sideways onto firmer ground. Now, John, if you can come around this side and stabilize the vehicle as we lift it up. Okay, the wheels are now off the ground. I'm going to jack it one more time, and then we're going to push it off the jack. Okay? One more. Now, I'm going to demonstrate the jack and push technique. Somebody always holds the jack and pushes the jack. Everybody else pushes the car. That prevents the jack leaping up and damaging the vehicle. Okay, are you ready? We're going to push. I'm try and push that way. Are you ready? Go. Steady? Let's go. Now, we have probably moved the with only the wheels that far off the ground in this demonstration, we've probably moved about 8 to 10 inches this way. Firstly, when a vehicle has been jacked with a high lift jack and wheels off the ground, it is incredibly unstable. Never have people digging or working on the vehicle. Keep them well away. The second bit is how a jack can treat you very unkindly. When you are ready to jack the vehicle down, if you're not using a jack and push technique, you hold it upright, you push that down, and now you jack the vehicle down. This is when a jack can bite you. Imagine you're working on the vehicle and you have left the jacking shaft like that. And your child comes along and plays with it. That's what happens. Now the jack is high enough, it will actually jack it itself all the way down. Now a lot of people mount their high lift jacks in very silly places on their vehicles. This is a very heavy piece of kit and it becomes a missile in an accident. The best place to mount them, either on the back, on the mounting here, or what I've done is I've mounted here. Now, it's a lovely permanent mounting there. Okay, it's easy to get to when I need it. The worst place on earth to mount a high lift jack is on a bull bar. I have seen them mounted here, even like that. Now what happens in an accident, these normally mild steel bolts that they're fitted with break and this goes straight through the windscreen. So not in front of the vehicle, always behind. Alternative to the sometimes clumsy high lift jack is the air jack. An air jack is a jack which is can be used from your exhaust gases from, from the vehicle, um, which will pump it up, which delivers quite a lot of volume of air. 
Um, if there is a failure in your exhaust system, you can pump it up with a, an ordinary pump. With this particular airbag, we've got a relief valve on it too. So when the pressure builds up beyond the diameters of, of the bag itself, it will release without bursting the bag. The top and the bottom are very important that they are nice. They protect the rubber duct type material on here. This is heat resistant on top. That is your uh, release valve on it. You press it in and it lets out the gas inside or the air inside the bag. The air jack is slid under the vehicle on ground that must be prepared first and made as flat as possible. The jack is manoeuvred underneath carefully so as to avoid any sharp edges under the vehicle. Pipe is then held against the exhaust. The bag then fills with exhaust and up it goes. The same safety advice applies. The vehicle is very unstable at this point. To let the jack down, simply open the valve. Jacks are an indispensable part of the 4x4 recovery kit. I'm going to try something now. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what we're going to find out. But we've been traveling together now for six days and some of it has been through horrific dust, particularly in the, the riverbed, the Orange River. The dust has been really, really severe. My vehicle is fitted with a Samari snorkel. The vehicle with me has not been. We've both got about 11,000 kilometers on the vehicles, new vehicles, and both have been traveling in similar circumstances. Yes, it is true that I've been on this trip ahead most of the time, so the vehicle behind me has been taking in a little bit more dust, but I want to see how well the Safari Snorkel works and uh, take out the air cleaners and see what happens. Okay, there's quite a bit of dust in there. Quite a bit of dust, but it still looks good. But, uh, I wouldn't say excessive, but there's dust, a fair amount of dust in that air cleaner. So now I think what we'll do is um, we'll go and have a look at the Colts and see if there is a marked difference between the two. Okay. Right, I'm going to go and make sure that this was all done well. Well, you saw it, I didn't set it up. As far as snorkel, no as far as snorkel. Similar conditions. You make up your mind. This map that we were given shows the borehole. We pick up our story as we venture westward through the Kalahari. Our water supplies are dwindling. 
we need to get past that sand village. It's on the other side of the Nguatla Pan, and if we're going to the, the woodlands which are there, we've got to go past the sand village and we can perhaps pick up some water along there. Villages scattered throughout the Kalahari rely on water supplies often brought in by truck. In this village, it was stored in two large plastic drums, but the level was low. The trickiest part of the operation was to find someone to give us permission to take their precious water. Having found the town clerk, she kindly offered us 50 litres. Their water truck was due tomorrow. Why don't you buy this for me to go and buy sugar, sir? Sugar, sugar. Sugar. Mm. Yeah, you know the problem. Too much sugar, too much tobacco. <laughs> Mix what? Uh, uh, my teeth are sharp, Your sharp. teeth are <laughs> <laughs> Most people's teeth here are not like it. Too much sugar and too much tobacco. Further west, we reach Nguatlapan. Rainwater still lies in muddy pools. Submersible pump. Time to test our water purification systems. Let's see if we can drink this water. If we got this water out of the pan, as you can see here, it's, it's a bit browny and animals have been drinking out of it. So we'll filter it and see if we can drink some. This is a catadine extreme membrane filter, where the water is pushed under pressure through a ceramic filter, fine enough to make the water sterile. It takes a while to suck this out. There you go, it's starting to get some. There you go. I wouldn't recommend it for drinking. It's slightly salty, it's a bit slightly briny. I'm certainly fresh enough to, to wash with and everything, but I don't know, you have, a t you have a taste. The odd taste turned out to be the result of the filter stored damp and not the water. After a while, the water became drinkable. There's my girl. Hey, look how clean and sparkly she's getting. We take this opportunity to refuel the thirsty Land Rover. There are hidden dangers when refueling from jerry cans. One of the most important safety elements when refueling from a vehicle, particularly with a petrol vehicle, jerry cans on the roof move like this, this dust generates static electricity. Before you open that cap, and before you open that cap, you ground it, and the best place is on the axle, okay, on the wheel nuts. Ground the jerry can then it is safe to open, thanks Steve, to open that. We're going to use the jerry spout, open it slowly because sometimes it can gush. Put on the jerry spout. The stiff jerry spouts are a lot more easier to use than the flexible ones and the reason is this. I can now rest that in the nozzle and it's not stressful, you don't have to keep holding 20 kilos.